In the last talk in this session, uh, we'll be switching from building a file system that's correct by construction to writing a specification and checking existing file systems against it. CybilFS is going to be an example of this, and Tom Ridge from the University of Leicester is going to tell us all about it. Great, thanks very much. Is this, uh, this okay? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, the title of the talk is CybilFS.io, uh, so that's actually the web page. You can go and uh, check out all of the stuff. Um, my name's Tom Ridge. Uh, this work was done with various other people at uh, Leicester in Cambridge. So I wanted to start with a true story. So about uh, two or three years ago, I had an idea for um, uh, writing a file system. So um, I'd been using file systems for about uh, 30 years by that point. Um, so I kind of had an idea of what they did. So there's a hierarchy of directories. There's files. Files can contain data. So I knew a bit about uh, permissions on files, but if you ask me like exactly how permissions work, say on directories and how they affect path lookup, I wouldn't have known. So I was just a normal user at that point. Uh, so I sat down to um, write this file system. It was gonna be the greatest file system ever. And um, uh, pretty shortly I had some code that was running. Uh, there were directories, files you could write, uh, data to, all this kind of stuff. And then I decided, I, okay, so, so I got the basics in place. I really need to fill in the details. So I looked at, I started with rename, and I thought, um, okay, so um, you know, what happens if you try and rename uh, a file that doesn't exist? And uh, so I wrote a little uh, test program to figure out uh, what was happening. So this is on Linux under X4. And um, it told me, okay, you get the error E no end. So I thought, okay, that's, that's great. So what happens if you try and copy a file on top of like a directory? So I write another script and uh, it tells me E is duh, so you can't copy a file on top of a directory, you get this error, E is duh. So as I kind of went on, there was a, like a huge explosion of uh, possible cases. And uh, writing test scripts for each of these cases is just, uh, you know, it's kind of infeasible. So what I really needed was a specification to tell me uh, what, what the behavior should have been in different, uh, different cases. So of course I kind of knew about man pages, I knew about uh, glibc, and at some point I became aware of uh, this thing that people call POSIX. So uh, POSIX is this specification. It's a, it's a great piece of work in many ways, so I'll just, um, I'll just get it up uh, on the screen. So this is uh, the POSIX specification for open, the uh, open system call. Uh, so uh, it's got like this description here, it's got a synopsis, so this is uh, the function, it's open, it takes a path, uh, some open flags, and it returns an int, which is a file descriptor. And then it's got a kind of description here of uh, what should happen. So the description's written in English, so informal English, but they've really made some attempts to kind of uh, make it kind of pretty precise and uh, understandable. So words like shall, have a particular meaning. So POSIX, at the beginning of POSIX, it says these are all special words and they have special meanings. And uh, yeah, so there are other kind of special words, so like undefined is a special word, which means something particular. Unspecified is another word that means something particular and it's different from undefined, and so on. So, uh, so this is the specification of open, and it kind of goes on. Uh, open has lots of flags, so uh, there's lots of different combinations you can have. And uh, it kind of goes on, and there's, you know, there's quite a lot of this stuff. Further and further, and then it talks about the return value. Uh, it talks about all of the different errors that can occur. Um, and eventually, oh, and then you get some examples at the end, and maybe uh, a rationale to explain why things are. And, and then at the end, you know, you've got the changes that, are, that have been made. So, Okay, so I was really excited at this point. So I thought, okay, th this is absolutely great. This is what I'm looking for. Um, it's gonna tell me exactly what should happen in all of these different cases that I'm worried about. Um, but uh, so there's, there's, there's some problems with this. So POSIX is really good in many ways. Uh, so one of the problems is that there's a lot of it. So this is just uh, the open call, right? So, and uh, in POSIX they specify kind of uh, an awful lot of libc calls. So there's thousands of pages which look like this. Uh, but that's okay because you kind of think, okay, I just have to read the ones that I'm interested in. I don't care about uh, a lot of these other pages. But it doesn't kind of work like that really because there's things like symlinks, uh, permissions, hard links that kind of cut across uh, different functions, right? So they're, they're gonna affect all of these functions in a way. And so they're specified kind of not in an individual page like this, but kind of um, in separate sections. So you have to read quite a lot of POSIX before you uh, get a handle on what's going on. So the, I mean, there's another problem that even if you do read it, uh, it's, it's actually quite hard to read because 
uh, different clauses kind of interact with each other. So you may kind of read a sentence and think you understand it, but then later you read another sentence which basically changes your understanding of what that first sentence was. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to read this stuff and get a really clear idea of what's going on. Of course, there are mistakes in POSIX as well. So they try to make each individual page kind of self-contained, but of course a lot of the errors are going to be shared between different pages. What's done is um, cut and paste uh, the different error clauses between different pages. But then you find that they then update the initial page, uh, they make some changes to the error conditions, but they forget to update it on the other page, so you get all these cut and, cut, uh, cut and paste errors, things like that. But the real problem is that I, I, so in other, I just never felt that I really kind of understood uh, what the POSIX specification was saying. Uh, in the main I did, but in the edge cases, you know, often it wasn't clear to me, basically. So another problem is that um, POSIX is POSIX. So POSIX talks about POSIX-compatible systems. And so some systems will claim to be POSIX-compatible, like Mac, for example, but is it really POSIX-compliant? Uh, POSIX or does it behave in kind of ways that uh, you know, aren't POSIX-compliant? Uh, and other systems of interest, like Linux, for example, it's very popular, and it, it doesn't claim to be POSIX-compliant. It's mostly POSIX-compliant, but in the corner edge cases, uh, it's not. So uh, so there's lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, questions here. So there's lots of questions about you know, how file systems, how compliant are they, where do they differ, how do file systems differ between themselves, um, this kind of thing. So there's lots of sources on the web. So you've got this POSIX specification, you've got man pages, libc docs, you've got bug reports. If you find a strange behavior under Linux, you can spend a thing, and you may find a bug report which talks exactly to uh, your problem. Stack Overflow is a relatively good source. The web, you can start to look at OS implementation code, file system implementation code. There's a ton of information out there, and there's an awful lot of detail. So it's very common that IT makes your head explode, basically. There's just too, there's too much detail here. So the problem is that it's, it's hard to be sure what file systems are supposed to do, and it's hard to be sure what real-world file systems actually do. Trying to manually pin down and analyze all the differences between all the libc OS file system combinations is, is a non-starter. You're not going to be able to do that. So we got um, so there's these general questions. How can we provide better specifications, and how can we validate real-world systems against these specifications? So these are like uh, fundamental and important questions, and uh, hopefully Sybil FS uh, provides uh, some of these answers. Okay, so that's really the motivation for my talk. So we really want to understand file system behavior in detail. So what is Sybil FS? So Sybil FS is simultaneously two things. So first, it's a file system specification. So a bit like POSIX, if you like. It tells you exactly what should happen in various uh, different scenarios. Yeah, so Sybil FS is simultaneously a file system specification and a test oracle that can be used to check real-world traces of file system behavior. So I'll discuss these, uh, these two aspects. So how is Sybil FS as a specification? So it's precise and unambiguous. So when you look at um, specifications like POSIX, they're written in informal English. Now, informal English, you can try to kind of make it precise and unambiguous, but it's not really what, what English was intended for. And especially with systems like POSIX, where the complexity is so large, um, effectively it's infeasible to make these informal English specifications absolutely precise and unambiguous. So with Sybil FS, we wrote it uh, in logic, so in the logic of a theorem prover, actually higher order logic. So logic kind of sounds scary to a lot of people, I know that, basically, but uh, if you look at the specification, it really just resembles code. So if you're used to kind of uh, reading code, you could probably uh, read the specification. Uh, maintainable, comprehensive, detailed, I'll come back to that later. So variants for POSIX, Linux, Mac, and FreeBSD. So, of course, POSIX is part of the, um, part of the question, but we're also interested in real-world file system behavior. So Sybil FS knows about all of the differences between uh, Linux, Mac, FreeBSD, how they differ from POSIX, um, and these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of issues. So... It's also a formal specification. So it's written in logic, but it's written in a logic in a theorem prover, and this means that a machine can understand it. So why is that important? 
as soon as you've got a machine uh, in play, you can start to do uh, lots of fancy things. So one of the things we've done is to prove properties about uh, the specification. So that's really interesting if you're a formal methods guy like me. But um, another thing that we did, which is probably more interesting to this audience, is uh, we constructed a test oracle from the specification. So what is the test oracle? So a test oracle takes a trace. Uh, so a trace is just a sequence of calls and returns at the libc interface. So we've got a trace down here. Um, so you've got things like make dir, and then you get back the value, you know, make dir succeeded, so it just says rv none. So you've got further make dirs, and at some point you open a file, and you get back the file descriptor three, and then you kind of write some data to the file, you get back uh, 83 bytes of written, and then you try and link, um, you try and make a hard link to a sim link in this case. So this is like a sim link, and you're trying to make a hard link to it, and it uh, returns successfully. So a trace is just a sequence of calls uh, at the libc interface. So you feed the trace into Sybil FS, and it gives you back a checked trace. So the checked trace tells you, um, is, this, is this behavior OK according to the Sybil FS model of what a file system is? So really, it's a pass-fail, but in fact, it gives you more than that. It kind of gives you um, information about exactly what went wrong. So here's, um, here's a checked trace. So as before, we got these make dir commands, and we got the rv none commands. You should just ignore this tau uh, here. So make dir, tau, et cetera. And eventually, we come to this link where we're trying to make a hard link to a sim link. And we get back the error eperm. And it's at this point that civil FS knows that something, something strange has happened. And it tells you fatal error, 75 eperm, no result states. So it's saying, it's, according to its model, it's impossible to make that transition. And it says, the spec allowed RV none, but uh, you know, we saw eperm, and that's not allowed according to the specification. So this is the kind of uh, feedback you get back from a Sybil FS test oracle. So two points in favor of Sybil FS. Um, so unlike traditional test suites, you don't need to write any boring test code. So with traditional tests, uh, you kind of write a piece of code that makes a call to the libc interface, gets the result back, and then you check it. So it, maybe it's an error, and you say, is it this error or this error? If so, it's OK. If it's not those errors, um, it's wrong. Writing these te these, this test code is uh, kind of really boring, and it effectively limits the amount of testing you can do. Um, so for example, in the POSIX test suite, there's 50 tests of the rename call. So in our test suite, there's 2,500 tests of the rename call, because we don't have to write the, the testing code. Really. So the other point is that checking traces is really fast. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to do combinatorial testing across a wide range of file systems on a wide range of different operating systems. OK, so what's the setup for combinatorial testing? It looks a bit like this. So it's, as before, we've got the traces, which we're going to feed to Sybil FS, and they're going to uh, produce checked traces, which are telling you kind of whether the trace is OK or not. So we've got this additional bit here. We've got uh, like a test generator, which generates test scripts. And uh, they're supplemented by handwritten test scripts. So what's a test script? So a test script is just a sequence of calls at the libc interface. So here's um, a test script here. Make dir, make dir, make dir, make dir. Open, write, close, link. So the point about these test scripts is it's very easy to generate these test scripts. right? So you can generate these test scripts to try all possible combinations of uh, calls at the libc uh, interface. So we generate all those test scripts, feed them to the test executor. So this takes a test script, executes it on the target system, and records the calls and returns at the libc interface. So we then feed that back into Civil FS and uh, check whether the behavior is OK. So uh, the results, we tested uh, more than 40 libc OS file system combinations. Uh, we had more than 20,000 uh, test scripts for each uh, combination, and we had to do this multiple times for each, uh, for each particular uh, platform. So there's various test results. So uh, in this audience, it won't be uh, surprising, perhaps, that implementation, file system implementation error codes are quite often non-POSIX. But the point is, OK, so we know that. But the point is, you can look at the Sybil FS specification and uh, read off exactly how they're different between each different OS and file system. 
So path resolution, particularly when a trailing flash is involved, is, invariable, is, is quite variable and non-POSIX. Treatment of paths referencing sim links, particularly when the path ends in a trailing flash, is highly variable. I mean, these, uh, path resolution is right at the heart of file systems, and there's quite a lot of variability uh, in there. And then you've got kind of various overlay file systems, mess up things like permissions and so on and so forth. And then you've got kind of some really serious errors. So, for instance, open ZFS on OS X. Possible to execute a sequence of calls which leads to the calling process hanging using 100% of the CPU, unresponsive to signals, volume ca cannot be unmounted, machine cannot be shut down, force unmounting may cause storage device to become unusable until next system restart. Okay, so um, this kind of shows that uh, we did a, a lot of testing, but uh, to my mind, these aren't the real results, right? So the real results are that uh, SybilFS is very accurate. So if you look at a particular platform like Linux X4, we've got almost 100% trace acceptance on uh, that particular platform. So SybilFS is an extremely accurate model of the behavior of file systems such as Linux X4. So the other thing is that um, there's something about the process here. So things can only get better over time. So, so normally, things get worse over time. Anybody who's uh, past the age of 40 will tell you that. But um, here, things can only get better over time because you've got the specification uh, which you refine. Uh, you refine the specification. You use it to test the implementations. You discover that bugs in the implementations, which you can report, or you discover that your specification is somehow um, is somehow wrong, it doesn't correctly match the real world implementations. So then you change your specification again, uh, maybe you refine it further, you add some more test scripts, and you go around that loop again. And at every point, you're adding more uh, test scripts, you're refining the specification, so things are getting better all the time. And if you're in that situation, you know, that's a good situation to be in. Okay, so um, I talk a lot about, you know, all of this goodness, etc. So in life, you rarely get something for nothing. So um, if there's all of this goodness here, where, um, where does it all come from? So show me the pain. So the process of constructing the specification is as follows. You basically take your initial version of the specification, you test it against a particular platform, you analyze and debug all of the um, failing traces, and then you can repeat that over and over and over again until the specification uh, gets right. And you have to do that for every platform of interest. So at this point, I've probably hand analyzed more than 1,000 uh, traces. And each trace can take somewhere between 10 minutes to a day to figure out uh, what's going on, basically. So it took an incredibly long time, and it's really boring work. Um, but the point is, the results of this analysis are captured in the spec, right? So they're not just written down informally somewhere. They're captured, pinned down in the specification formally. And this work only has to be done once, and everybody can benefit from uh, that knowledge. So uh, another pain point is um, the specification and traces are, are different things. So uh, traces are just uh, sequences, of, um, sequences of calls and returns. They don't have very much structure. The specification, you really don't want it to become a mass of special cases treating uh, particular traces. So you have to impose a lot of structure uh, on the specification. So when you write the specification, you're doing something clever. You're coming up with structure that isn't necessarily there in the, in the traces that you're observing. So that obviously takes human ingenuity, and that's, that's, that's one of the places where um, the pain comes in. So writing the specification is difficult enough. Uh, writing the specification so it can be efficiently used to efficiently check implementations makes it even more difficult. So, yeah, so this is, I'm not advocating this for everybody, but uh, just to kind of give you some idea of where the pain was. Okay, so what could you use all of this stuff for? So, okay, we've talked about the fact that it's a specification, so it could be used as a complement for POSIX, um, or if you wanted to understand particular Linux, Mac, or FreeBSD behaviors, or if you wanted to identify all the differences between different file systems and OSs, or how a particular file system uh, differed from POSIX, say, um, the spec can answer all of these, all of these questions for you. So, so here's two things that are directly related to SOSP. So for example, uh, we get new file systems uh, all the time. So we just heard about FSCQ. FSCQ is an amazing piece of work. Um, so one thing you could think of doing would be to 
uh, test FSCQ using Civil FS. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, you can come and talk to me at the uh, poster session later. Uh, another thing you could do, um, so I see a lot of papers in uh, this venue. Uh, so there's a paper, Scalable Commutativity Rule in SOS 2013. So it's another great paper. So they want to talk about file system behavior, but they don't have uh, a model. So they, they write their own model uh, using something they call symbolic Python. And the first, well, one of the first questions they get uh, after their presentation is, how do you know that your model is right? And essentially, they say, well, we kind of looked at POSIX a lot, and uh, we did some tests, and basically, if there were any bugs, we fixed them. But uh, effectively, that's not the focus of their work. Their, fo their focus is somewhere else. So the model is not really that highly validated. And there's lots of papers like this that have a need for a model of a file system. Uh, so CivilFS is a very high quality, highly validated model that people could reuse uh, in their research. Uh, so here's a summary. So CivilFS is a formal specification of file system behavior. It's simultaneously a test oracle that can be used to check file system behavior. And it's actually usable in practice for combinatorial testing and analysis of file systems. Stepping back a bit, the process that I've talked about here is a, a general thing, right? Develop a formal specification, use it for testing. So yeah, I, I'm a big advocate of this kind of process uh, being applied to different uh, parts of computer systems. Okay, so a final slide. Uh, what does this mysterious specification look like? So uh, my poster uh, later today has an excerpt from the specification. I think it's really readable. So sure, it's logic, but it kind of looks like code, and it's actually very simple code. So I think it's really readable. I'd love to explain it to you at the poster session. Then you can decide what you think. Anyway, that's, uh, that's enough from me. Thanks very much. Uh, cheers. Paul Taysom, Datrium. I'd like to know how you'd extend this to looking at concurrent behavior or let me give you a specific example, LSeq of a shared file pointer where one process can seek and the other process sees the, the change in that seek. How would you capture that in this specification language? Um, so, so, so I missed the uh, second half of your question, but uh, I think you're asking about concurrent specification. Well, LSeq in particular, um, where I seek in one process, yeah. another process who shares the same file descriptor will see the results of that seek. How yeah. do you specify that behavior? Okay, okay so well, I didn't touch on it in these slides, but uh, actually this, this includes the specification of concurrent behavior. So things like permissions and things like that. So I show traces which involve one process, but actually you can have uh, traces involving multiple processes uh, all interacting concurrently and stuff like that. Yeah, so the spe it, it handles all of that concurrent stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yang Tang from Columbia University. Uh, so in your trace, do you include an initial state of your file system? Uh, the initial state is assumed to be uh, blank, basically. So it's just a root, empty root directory. Uh, so, so there's some inputs. Uh, so you need to know, yeah. Effectively, yeah, it's just a blank file system. So that, that's why you see all of these initial setup commands at the beginning, like creating directories and stuff like that. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. But, but I mean, the specification could be, you, you know, it, if you want to apply this specification, it, it, you don't have to have a blank uh, file system to start with, of course. It, you know, you could, yeah. Uh, very glad you handled concurrency. Um, did you look at all at, at uh, you know, crash behavior? Uh, Right, so, <laughs> um, okay, so, so crash behavior is, so file systems are about um, preserving data over crashes, right? So crash behavior is the really interesting part of the scenario. Um, as one of the reviewers says, you have to walk before you can run. Um, so this is handling <laughs> everything that isn't the crash behavior. So we have some ideas about how to deal with crash behavior but I mean, one of the things is that people were also talking about, like, how do you specify, um, you know, wh what is the specification of how a crash should behave? So if you've got, like, transactions which are running serially, then th the specification is relatively clear. But a lot of file systems, you know, will optimize. They'll reorder kind of um, different processes, um, you know, um, 
commands and, and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, to give a good specification for that is actually quite difficult. So I have some ideas, um, but there's a question of whether or not people would actually care about it and stuff like that. So yeah, anyway. Austin Clements, Google. Uh, how do you decide how long your traces should be? So in the scalable commutativity work, we always looked at two operations because that's what made sense for that work. But in your case, sort of generalizing that, I'm not sure how, like, when should you stop the trace? It could be arbitrarily long. Yeah. Okay, so SibleFS can handle arbitrarily long traces. Um, so the, the manually written traces uh, you know, can be, I think there's some up to a, like 300 or 400 steps or something like that. So, so there's no problem with handling long traces. So there's a story to be told about um, why, there, why have we got automated, automatically generated tests and manual tests, right? And the story for why the automated tests cover, so what, what behaviors they cover and how are we sure that they cover those behaviors to explain that would take a whole another paper, basically. So, so yeah, so suffice it to say that, so the automatic, automatically generated tests are testing the things that you could imagine could be tested that way. So things like testing all possible link uh, commands or something like that. So things that you can't really test easily that way. And, uh, and how do we know that we've tested all of the combinations? Because there's an argument in the background which involves more formal stuff about properties that affect file system behavior and so on and so forth, which I haven't mentioned here and we didn't even talk about it in the paper. So yeah, so we think that those are pretty, pretty in pretty good shape. So the, manual, the manually written tests are things uh, which aren't so easily tested like that. So read and write or concurrent kind of behaviors um, so there, we, we're not sure that the tests are, are that good. We're, we're pretty sure that you could improve on our current set of tests. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Oh. And thank you for being a good sport with our failing microphone.